Please welcome our panel, Ambassador John Bolton, American Enterprise Institute, Ariel Davidson, Hoover Institution, Dr. M. Zudi Jasser, American Islamic Forum for Democracy, moderated by Breitbart London's Raheem Kassam. I hope we don't have five minutes. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for having us. And a special thank you to our wonderful uh, panelists here. Uh, I'm going to try and speak as little as possible because we have so much expertise here. Um, I am grateful for uh, Matt Schlapp and the ACU and all the hardworking staff who have made this happen. Um, I, uh, uh, when Matt first asked me to moderate, I said, how dare you? And he said, no, moderate a panel, not moderate your views. Okay. <laughs> I said, okay, I can do that. So, so here we are. What, what are the largest threats to the United States? Uh, is it radical Islam? Is it China? Is it Russia? Is it rogue states, rogue actors? Uh, or secret answer D or E or F? All of the above. Um, we have... So, well, there we go. We've answered the question now. Um, we have such a wonderful panel here with us. Uh, Ambassador John Bolton, who really... <laughs> really is such a, a personal hero of mine. Um, the, the, the man who I'm sure so many of us uh, hope and look forward to hearing a lot more from in policy areas over the next few years. Uh, I hope I haven't overstepped any mark there, <laughs> Ambassador, but I say it often and I say it proudly. Thank you. Thank uh, you Ariel much. Davidson, uh, uh, Ho uh, Hoover Institute and, uh, and Claremont Institute uh, fellow, uh, Russia expert, and uh, we'll start with Ariel because I know the media uh, uh, need their Russia fix. Uh, so we'll get onto that. And, and Dr. Zudi Jasser, who is possibly one of the bravest people out there at the moment. Yes, you are. <laughs> Dr. Jasser and his organization, he spends his time fighting the, the Sharia elements that are not just, as you heard from our previous speaker, digging the talons in all across the world but right here in the United States to believe me, it is happening. And Dr. Jasser is on the front lines, front lines fighting radical Islam. And let me tell you, as somebody like myself, who was born into a Muslim family and decided it wasn't for me, I doff my cap as many times a day as possible to someone like Dr. Jasser, who endures so many threats, so many threats to himself and his family for doing what he does. So Dr. Jasser, thank you. Thank you for everything you do here. So let's start, ladies first, with, uh, with Ariel. Uh, uh, the, the, the media have to have their Russia fix. And the question I want to ask from the start is, we've now heard about these indictments. We've heard about uh, the, the meddling for some time. Still no collusion Evident. If you find any under your seats, let us know. If there's any collusion evidence out there, we can hand it off to the press. Look, my question for you, Ariel, is number one, you know, what, what is the strategic threat that Russia poses? And uh, I, have the likes of CNN <coughs> actually become complicit with doing what we know some Russians, uh, state actors, did want to do, which is disrupt American democracy? Well, first off, thank you for that lovely introduction, Raheem. Um, and thank you to the ACU and to CPAC in general for being here. Uh, so that's a really loaded question. I think what I'd like to start with is sort of the uh, post-Cold War era that we're inhabiting. Um, you know, during the Cold War, we really were within a bipolar world in terms of our, we viewed our national security issues through the prism of communism. And we're not really afforded that simplistic luxury anymore, I would argue. Uh, and Russia, we're starting to see now, at least under the auspices of Putin, is really trying to recapture that former greatness that was associated with the Soviet Union. And we're starting to see that as being the justification for forays into the Middle East, um, for increased relations in uh, Asia, and 
um, you know, violating the sovereign integrity of Ukraine. So when we talk about what is Russia's ambitions is really to sort of recapture greatness. Um, you know, in Putin's mind, there's no such thing as a weak Russia. In order for Russia to exist, she must be great. And that is something that has been defining quite a bit of Putin's policy. Um, you know, Russia is the only country with which we have uh, nuclear parity, so that for that reason, Russia will always hold a special place in our hearts in terms of how we view her through the prism of national security. Um, I also do believe that Russia is in a very, um, I want to say, unique situation in which they've never, they've never, she's never really had a history of adhering to individual rights. It's always been about everything is done for the sake of the state of Russia. Um, and that is something that is, again, defined quite a bit of national security policy. So going to your question, you know, what does this mean for the United States? Uh, I think we have to approach our relationship with Russia very carefully in the sense that she is not our primary foe, but I do believe that she is, it's not that it's, she is a non-actor. And in that case, I think we need to be very cognizant of the footprint that Putin is trying to expand across the globe and be highly aware of that. I know Zudi is going to speak much more about that. Um, in terms of the information warfare that took place, as we've seen with the latest Miller papers, um, you know, that's par the course for Russia. So, you know, you and I have talked about this earlier, Rahim, this organization, Rasiskaya Satrunichistva, which is this um, 2008 propaganda arm that started in Russia, uh, basically funds pseudo NGOs across the globe in order to disseminate the Kremlin's narrative and to, quote, win over the hearts and minds of people in various countries to make them accept Russian supremacy, um, which is very bizarre. And the other thing they also like to do, which is going to answer the last part of your question, is they like to convince people that their current government is incompetent. And if we look at sort of the state of our media right now, you know, there is an element in which the constant criticism and critique is, you know, criticism is healthy. But at what point does it sort of become, you know, are we establishing the idea that the U.S. government is incompetent? And that, to me, is a very dangerous notion. You know, there's a, there's a point at which criticism becomes almost unhealthy, and it's subversive in some ways. So, you know, this is when Russia, um, Russian nationals engaged in these troll farms and this um, dissemination of propaganda, they really did sort of, their hope was to subvert and to create chaos, because that has been the mission of this propaganda arm you know, for the last 10 years, and be decades before that. Russians are experts in information warfare. So hopefully that was about a... Russia, I thought you were talking about CNN for a moment. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that gives you a little bit of, of you know, it was a longer answer, but yes. Ambassador Bolton, uh, I want to bring you in on this, um, and, and hope uh, as well we can expand into uh, Russia in the Middle East, and of course, uh, Dr. Jassa, uh, and, and feel free to, uh, you know, j just ignore me. I mean, I'm, I'm just here to facilitate, but if you guys want to jump in at any time, jump in, Ambassador Bolton. Well, I think the Mueller indictment last uh, Friday is a potentially very important opportunity for the Trump administration in dealing with Russia in its various threat manifestations. You know, I think the president was rightly concerned politically that the endless drumbeat of the media, that the Russian uh, information campaign was to support Trump for president, for Trump against Hillary, that there was so much of it that uh, people would come logically, if incorrectly, to the conclusion that the Trump campaign must be colluding with Russia. You couldn't have that much of a campaign without uh, knowing uh, Trump campaign involvement. The Mueller indictment, while it's uh, far from the last word, let's be very clear, there's still a lot we don't know, but in, in its uh, 100 paragraphs of explanation, uh, eliminates, at least as far as we know, both those elements. Uh, there is no allegation of collusion by the Trump campaign or anybody else. Uh, and it's clear from the indictment that the Russian effort is an attack on the Constitution. It's to sow mistrust of our institutions, to corrode the public faith uh, in our electoral process, and that it supports or opposes candidates as a means to that end, not the end in itself. So I would hope that the president, with this political leeway that the indictment gives, contrary to what the media are saying, but in reality, can now say in a, in a very forthcoming way about Russian interference in our politics 
what he's already started to do about the Russian presence in the Middle East, what he's started to do about Russian interference in Central and Eastern Europe. The president should say, no foreign power, no foreign power messes with American elections. Nobody, nobody around the world challenges the American Constitution. And I, I'll tell you this, I think we ought to retaliate uh, for the uh, Russian cyber attacks on our election process. I think, I think the retaliation should not be proportionate. I think it should be decidedly disproportionate. I, th I think this is to create structures of deterrence so that neither the Russians nor anybody else think about trying it again. I think, I think that's the right policy, and here's the right politics for the president. In any debate, between conservatives and liberals over who will defend the Constitution best. Who do you think will win that debate? Wow. Dr. Jasser. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things we missed is, and if you look at the choices we had in, the, in this panel, it's Russia, China, rogue states, you missed that the pot stewing all of this is radical Islam. You have, if you look at the threats domestically, in Europe, the terror attacks, there have been Uzbeki natives, Afghani natives, uh, Bangladeshi natives. So every country that has a Muslim majority population is going through this battle between two evil fascisms. One is a secular military dictatorship fascism and the other is theocratic fascism. Both are not our allies. There has to be third choices. And finally now we have a president of the White House. We have parties controlling Congress that are no longer wasting t all of our time in figuring out what the diagnosis is, we acknowledge as conservatives that the diagnosis is theocratic Islam. Islamism is the problem. So why don't we get on with the business of fixing this problem and looking for solutions? I'm, I'm the son of, of Syrian immigrants who are patriotic Americans because we embraced American freedom, the ability to practice our faith more freely than we could in any so-called Muslim country, but also they were American patriots because they rejected Soviet imperialism in Syria in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, rejected Baathism, rejected Islamism to come embrace American liberty. And what's happening is we are not taking sides in Syria, we're not taking sides in Iran. The greatest protection for American threats coming from Iran's nuclear program would be a revolution. And yet, where is American policy and taking sides on the people in the streets. We had President Trump tweeting out for a few days after the revolution started just a month or so ago, tweeting out support for the people on the streets, something President Obama never did. We need to follow through with that and convene a whole of government strategy where the real, the greatest threat of the 21st century is political Islam, theocratic Islam. We need to convene a commission on radical Islamism that will begin to have a whole of government strategy through the State Department, through the Pentagon, through uh, Homeland Security, where all of a sudden we look at immigration through the lens of not letting Islamists come here, but letting those who embrace our values, looking at our approach to Russia being, if they're going to support Shia Islamists and Hezbollah and genocide in Syria, that's certainly not our ally. Yet again, we're not going to support Sunni Islamists like the Saudi royal family might be our short-term friends, but long term, they're the founding fathers of ISIS's ideology. So we have to be careful if we don't come together as a nation, and especially as a conservative movement, and realize what ideas we stand for, not only what we're against, terrorism and communism and Islamism, but what are we for? We have to advance what we're for, and we finally, I think, have the ability and the president of the White House that can do that if we convene a commission and begin to shift the axis of, of discussion from CVE which is countering violent extremism, to CVI, which is countering violent Islamism. And every one of you, I hope, goes back to your Congress, men or women, and tells them, we need to shift from CVE to CVI. There was, there was once upon a time a whiteboard in the White House, which had a lot of points on it. And one of those points was uh, the prescription of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Um, when, when this 
members of the administration will be watching this and reflecting upon what is being said, I hope. Um, wh what do we have to say as a panel about the fact that there is no prescription of the Muslim Brotherhood yet? I, I, I think that is a pretty uh, a simple thing to get done. It is something that was, uh, as far as I am concerned, in, in the area of radical Islam, a core campaign promise. Ambassador Bolton, would you start us off on that? Uh, I would have uh, put the Brotherhood on the uh, list of foreign terrorist organizations on uh, January the 20th, 2017. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any question about this. Uh, you know, too often uh, our diplomats fall prey to the idea that uh, uh, whether it's the Irish Republican Army or any kind of terrorist group you mentioned, well, there's a humanitarian wing of Hezbollah <laughs> and there's a, then there's a political wing of Hezbollah or a military wing. Likewise with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's one organization. It's motivated by one ideology. And to me, that's the fundamental issue here to understand, as the Obama administration did not, but as I think as President Trump does, what we're fighting here is not uh, a concept like violence. We're fighting a radical ideology that grows out of Islam, political Islam, call it what you will. That ideology detests Western civilization and America in particular. So we didn't create the ideology. We may not uh, like uh, having to deal with it, but if we don't acknowledge what we're fighting, we're never going to prevail. I want to bring Dr. Jasser in on that because I know there's a, there's a nuance that we discussed uh, earlier that, that might have a bit of a counterpoint, and then Ariel. Yeah, I'm not sure how much daylight there is between me and uh, Ambassador Bull. I think I agree. My, I would nuance it and say that if you sort of globally declare the Muslim Brotherhood a, a, a terror organization, you're going to find, what about Al Jazeera, which is staffed with mostly <laughs> Muslim Brotherhood? Does that become a terror satellite network? Maybe. Um, but the bottom line is, is that you've got the Egyptian Brotherhood, which I think the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, which is the you know, uh, home base, the, the central nuclear cancer cell of the global Muslim Brotherhood, that should be labeled a terror organization. Hamas already is. Offshoots that are terror organizations should be labeled as such. But ideologues in London, Muslim Brotherhood has an office there. In America, we don't have religious parties, so therefore the Muslim Brotherhood never put its uh, flag down or an office down, but yet there's a lot of believers in Islamism. As an Arab Muslim, I would tell you as an Arab American, the Muslim Brotherhood is an ideology. In the Middle East, they don't carry cards, even in the Middle East where they have a party. There are many supporters of the Brotherhood that don't carry cards, but yet you know they're Brotherhood types because of the Islamist ideology. So just like when we were fighting the Cold War, we understood the American Communist Party was not our ally, we're not the place to go to for help in fighting the Soviets, but we didn't shut them down. We allowed them the freedom to speak out so that we could monitor them, and, and we realized that they were a threat and precursors to significant threats, but we didn't uh, necessarily shut them down. I think similarly, Muslim Brotherhood type organizations in the West, as long as they're not advocating terror and violence, it's easier to, to monitor them when they're above ground than when you push them underground. And the Middle East dictatorships are classic examples of this. Whenever they've push the Brotherhood underground, they come back five to ten years later to really wreak havoc in their society. Errol, we haven't yet touched on, on China, and um, I, I hope you'll give us a, a little bit of insight into China. When, when President Xi gets up and gives his 300-hour long speeches, he's not talking about uh, here's how we plan to defeat America or here's how we plan to dominate the world. He's declaring we've already done it. Uh, I mean, when we're having this conversation about what the greatest threat to uh, America is, the Chinese think they've already won. Right. Well, I, I actually will sort of combine what I was going to respond to Zudi and sure. answer to your question. So I think that our biggest threat will always, is uh, not always, but for right now, is um, radical Islamic ideology as opposed to a nation state, primarily because an ideology can go through several different iterations, and when you think or you suppose that it might have been quelched or stomped out in one region of the world, it can regrow, regrow itself, um, it can spread, it, it transcends borders, um, and it doesn't require a ton of funding. If you think about the way in which ideology spreads now through social media, you can use all sorts of platforms that don't require any sort of real monetary backing behind it. And so it makes you know, messages very accessible. For instance, um, you know, one of the greatest issues that they're having the, the window between, or the connection between ISIS and Europe for quite a bit of time, at least 2015, 2016, was Russia. And quite a bit of ISIS videos were coming out, propaganda videos and recruitment videos were being done in Russian. I've seen them myself. And it's alarming and it's also one of those ways in which 
ideology, again, doesn't need to belong to a nation state. It can attract followers from around the globe. And I think that's what makes it tremendously dangerous. And that's why I would agree with Sudi 100%. Um, in terms of China, China is in an interesting position right now relative to the United States and Russia. It has a better relationship with U.S. and Russia than uh, United States and Russia have with each other. Um, it's in, you know, as its power is growing, Russia's power is waning. And we're starting to see sort of a, a greater Eurasian alliance as opposed to Russia sort of trying to join itself with Europe as have been the primary um, attempts that Putin had made prior to 2014 Ukrainian crisis. So, um, you know, China, I think Ambassador Bolton will probably have more to say about that. But I do think that China is trying its best to walk a fine line um, between, you know, maintaining its status in, as an economic powerhouse, which it's facing a demographic crisis in the coming decades. So we'll see what the, the result of that will be. Um, but I do believe that, you know, China is in a very unique position. And I'm, I, I'm curious to see where it goes forward from here. It is 10 times the size. It's the largest country population-wise in the world. So. Ambassador Bolton, uh, the, the, the Chinese are sort of declaring victory in, in, in this, you know, what they perceive as a long war here. Um, but but the, the North Korean stuff, I mean, I don't think the media has truly recognized that President Trump uh, really, uh, in a lot of ways via Twitter, managed to uh, shut down Little Rocket Man, or at least bring Little Rocket Man to the table. Uh, a, have the Chinese won, and B, what do you think is lacking in terms of the recognition about what this president has done on the international stage? Well, I think on the China question, uh, we have suffered as a country for several decades uh, by operating under the assumption that prevails in the business community, prevails in the U.S. government, prevails in academia that China is engaged in a peaceful rise, that's one buzz phrase, uh, and that it simply seeks uh, to take its place, its rightful place uh, in the community of nations and that we simply have to accept this. Now, that is one possible scenario for China, but it's not the only scenario uh, and the idea that it's gonna become a responsible stakeholder, another buzz phrase in the international system, is only one possible outcome. I think the real pattern of Chinese behavior is incredibly aggressive and assertive. Uh, they're building bases on rocks and reefs in the South China Sea that are on a good day are only three inches above water. They are today mapping the seabed of the Indian Ocean. And they're not doing it to find fish. They want to know where they can put their submarines when they develop an undersea fleet. This is a very aggressive development. There's a panel on China tomorrow. We'll talk more about it. But what we require is a comprehensive American strategy. The president has raised the issues of Chinese violations of their obligations under international trade agreement, their piracy of intellectual property, their discrimination against foreign investors and business people in China. Uh, that's an important aspect, but we need a political military strategy as well. And we need what we need, what we had in the Cold War of linkage, that all of these issues are together. And if China wants to know how we will treat them, it depends on how they behave across the board. I do think President Trump now has convinced both North Korea and China that Barack Obama is no longer president, which is the single most important thing that he could do. But, but make no mistake, as, uh, as CIA Director Mike Pompeo said recently, North Korea is within a handful of months, his phrase, handful of months, to having the capability of dropping thermonuclear weapons on any American city they want. So the Trump administration has some very hard decisions to make in the very near future. If China really believed what they've said for 25 years, which is that they don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, now is the time for them to act. And if they don't act and act dispositively as they could, they'll tell us a lot about China. We've got about a minute and a half left, Sudi. Yeah, yeah, I think a really important point is a lot of these different responses that state dictators would have to America come on the heels of how they perceive us. It is time, and as President Trump has begun to do, Secretary Mattis has done with the almost complete decimation of ISIS, they realize that America has to be reckoned with. And, and that reckoning, that reckoning means, I mean, how many of you think that actually with ISIS almost gone, that radical Islamic threat will go away? Nobody. 
So the reason is, is you have Erdogan radicalizing his population to the Islamist caliphate movement, the Khomeinis radicalizing their population, you have the, the Saudis still pushing Wahhabism, maybe they're marginalizing brotherhood ideology, but still Wahhabism, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, you have Egyptian Islamism. All over the world, Islamism is still thriving and we are not on the offense. We need to start realizing that not military, we're never going to win this militarily, we can do the whack-a-mole thing militarily, but until we take liberty and freedom on the offense in an information war, just like the Russians have had here, the Islamists send their immigrants and send their ideas here, we have to take the ideas of liberty in Arabic and in Farsi and every language to begin to have an offense for countering violent Islamism, not just extremism. Well, I wish we had more time. We, you know, we, uh, Iran and Venezuela and more on North Korea and everything. We could have touched on so many things, but uh, I want to thank our panelists here for really laying out the uh, what are the core national uh, uh, security threats for the United States. And uh, thank you all of uh, you guys for being here and supporting. Thank you, Ambassador John Bolton, Ariel Davidson, Dr. Zudi Jassa. Cheers. This way.